Hey everybody, welcome to Drive Through Review 240. Uh, today I'm going to talk about Battle Lore Second Edition. This is a brand new release from Fantasy Flight. Uh, you can tell by the name Second Edition, it is not the first edition of Battle Lore. There was a game that was released several years ago by Days of Wonder, and then Fantasy Flight acquired it, and then they did a couple little expansions, and then it kind of just died off, and there's been sort of iterations on this system. Now this is sort of the command and color system. This one doesn't quite fit the normal definition of what you'd call command and colors, uh, but that started with a Battle Cry game, which was like a Civil War game, and then Memoir 44, and Battle Lore, uh, Samurai Battles is one, the Command and Colors Ancients, Napoleonics. There's been a lot of games in this system. And Battle Lore, first edition, was definitely my favorite. It did add on, I wouldn't call it complexity, but there was a little bit more setup involved, a little bit more sort of configuration of your army and, and your faction, if you will, uh, in that game. So, does this one live up to the name of Battle Lore? Well, let's just uh, take a quick look at some of the components that you're going to get. The components are stellar, I'll just tell you that right off the bat. Uh, and then take a look at some of the changes. It does retain some of that lore flavor, you know, the Battle Lore aspects of it. So you've got lore cards and lore tokens that you're going to be generating and spending. Uh, but it does some things quite a bit differently. So let's take a look at it and I'll come back and tell you what I think. Okay, as you can see here, I've got a scenario set up as a sort of a sample. And before I get too far into it, I just want to make uh, something kind of interesting clear here. So the game actually comes with two rule books. You have your sort of basic rule book and then your reference book. Uh, they did this with Eldritch Horror recently, and I really like how they did this. You can read this rule book uh, probably about halfway through, jump into sort of like a beginner learning scenario. And in my opinion, you could just read all the way through it. It's pretty straightforward. It's short. It has nice illustrated examples and all that stuff. And then when you come to a situation, maybe through a lore card or something you're not quite sure how it works uh, retreat works a little bit differently here than in other command and colors games so if you want to just reference that quickly uh, you can go through the reference book here it's indexed uh, very clear examples even got you know line of sight examples and things like that so once you kind of put this away then you can leave the reference out here it has uh, you know the die results what they mean these are a little bit different than command and colors and then a quick reference on the different terrain things and stuff in overall game phases so that's a kind of a nice way to do it now to set up the scenario there's a couple of ways to do it there is a campaign game but sort of the normal way that you're going to do it is you're going to have each faction with these deck of scenario cards and so you can either sort of play through a campaign kind of going through these in order so to speak or maybe do a little sort of a draft where you draw three and then choose one and what you can see here is it sort of sets up half of the board here so i've got the um blue decon lords on that side and then the red i don't know how to pronounce this the uthuks on this side and so the blue players say he took uh, this one. I think this is the one we used here. Yes, so you can see here, you're gonna set up a little bit of terrain. There's gonna be a little sort of middle ground that you see to your opponent, and then you get this kind of middle ground on that side. And then you can see all the areas shaded on blue are where I could possibly put my units. And similarly, with the Uthuks here, we have this one here. You can see I've got the river there and all this stuff. And then I have the different units in these red areas here. Now, the other cool thing about these is these will actually change the rules of the game slightly here. So friendly units do not need to end their movement when entering a forest hex. Normally, when you move into a forest, it stops movement. In this case, you've got a little bit of more of an advantage here. And then in the VP step, you gain one victory point if friendly units occupy at least one of each type of the following terrain. And there's a whole mixture of just conditions and things, some things that will cause you to spend lore tokens, which I'm actually very happy about. Um, so, and these are going to be easily expandable. It comes with, let's see, 14 of these, and uh, then you can sort of mix and match. And the initiative is actually going to be decided based on the letter and the number if they're tied. So if otherwise it's random. So let's say let's do an example here. So I reveal B2, you reveal B1, so you'd get the initiative and go first. And the other interesting thing about this game is uh, whoever gets the first player will get this, and you're going to play an equal number of turns because the game is going to be won by accruing victory points. That can be done by occupying victory point hexes there, just generating victory points. There might be other conditions on the scenario cards that you can gain victory points for for some of the lore cards and things will give you victory points so it's going to be about sort of holding key terrain you know manipulating the terrain you know putting your units in the right spot getting your ranged units in the right area to sort of take them out 
Now after you choose your scenario card, you're going to, each faction gets this deck of muster cards here. And these are little sort of hobbit sized cards here. And these represent the various different units on the board here. So we can see we have the Citadel Guard, which is that sort of melee unit there. You've got the Iraq Warrior there. You can see that's that large flying bird over there. So what you're going to do is you're going to take this stack here and put these face down, covering every last hex that's described there. Now, some of these are going to be decoys. So you put all of these out and you can have basically uh, muster points on all the different units. So you can't go over a specific number of uh, muster points, 50 points, and then you everybody will reveal and put all their units out on the board. Now the game also comes with some pre-built army cards. You can just use these for a quick reference just to get set up. And I found that we can just set up without worrying too much about what the other player is doing. But this is interesting because uh, if you know the command and color system, you know that you've got the left, center, right. So even though we're going to have key objectives on the board, sometimes a city will be a key objective, for example, you still want to kind of spread your units out so that if you get a hand of, you know, left cards, you got those, uh, you know, in happening. And you remember if they're in the middle, though, they're also able to be activated if they're on either side. Now, if you don't feel like spending all 50 points, you can get lore tokens to start. Uh, these are the currency you're going to be able to use to activate sort of special ability cards. So you don't have to spend all your muster points to put out units. These are kind of nice to have at the start of the game, uh, maybe seeding a little bit of position to your opponent uh, to have to activate some of your cool abilities. The other interesting development here we have are these command tents. Now each faction has one of these. These actually reduce the overall cost a total of all of the units you've put out. But you're going to put this out. It's a special hex. You can see it's a different hex for each of the factions. And you can't deploy any units uh, in front of this. And you're basically making this a nice target for the opponent. If they go in here and control that and occupy that, they'll be able to kind of destroy that and they get two victory points. But it does allow you to put some extra units. So there's a little bit of playing around with, you know, the amount of lore you start with, where you put the units out. It's really cool. I like how they've really kind of uh, gotten rid of, frankly, building the lore deck and kind of converted that into focusing on the different units. So let's take a look at one of the units here. So now here we have the Rock Royer, which is, you know, that big bird there. So it's got some different special abilities. It's got its movement ability. It's got the number of dice it's going to roll and it's got its health. Now, normally that means the number of units that are going to be inside of that formation there. So you can see the Rune Golem has three, so there's going to be three here. Now the Rock Warrior, as well as this Chaos Lord here, which let's take a look at one of these real quick. Really nicely detailed, you know, got some nice stuff on there. I actually had to assemble a couple of these. It's, I didn't even glue them. You just snap everything in. I mean, you could paint these if you want. I think they look nice as is. But uh, this unit here, as well as the Rock Lord, you're actually going to mark uh, with little HP tokens as it takes damage and then remove it from the board once it dies there. So you've got all of these different special abilities here uh, and some things will trigger off of die rolls here so you have these little command tokens here so when this happens you know for this guy if you've activated this chaos unit he's going to terrify and then cause a the unit to retreat and things like that. Okay once you get everything set up and set up is relatively involved but this is the kind of game that I won't just you know break out and play once I usually play it two or three times times in a row. Uh, but once you've got everything set up and you know in between games it's very easy to kind of just you know go quickly back into uh, another scenario or even play the same scenario again if you want maybe with some different configurations. I want you to do that. The first thing you do is draw some of these command cards and these are sort of the bread and butter of you know the CNC system. Very simple. Uh, if you're familiar with it, uh, order three units in the left section here for example. So you got one, two, three sections. You order that. You can activate three different units. Move them up to their uh, movement allowance there and then possibly roll dice for combat if you have you know range and line of sight and things. There'll be some other special ones like this one here. Order three cavalry units. Uh, for the red player here I've got these guys here. I love these little hellhound guys here. These are hell or excuse me cavalry units for the Uthuk faction there. So I could order different different types of units, units that are maybe adjacent to other players. So a lot of the game is going to be sort of uh, you know knowing when to play these, you know, when it's a good time, not wasting, you know, all of your left cards, for example. So now you can't activate anything on the left for a long time. So you're always going to play a card here, activate, do something, and then draw back up. Now, you're also going to draw these lore cards. And you can see here the faction symbol on these different decks there. So you're going to have a set of these here, and you can see here's the cost. And again, you're going to get lore tokens throughout the game. You're also probably going to start with a couple of these 
and then you can play these at different times so you can say play this after a friendly viper legion unit poisons an enemy and then you play this and do its effect or you can do summon swarm or you know pillage your opponent loses two lore and you gain two two lore so that's free so you can do different things it's pretty cool how this works because you'll have a set of these and some of these are almost like you're baiting somebody in so that you can you know activate a really cool lore ability or you know it, it, these will kind of help you sort of dictate and give you options as far as your strategy on the board so i've always really enjoyed this about uh the original battle lore and samurai battles where you're not just considering, you know, kind of raw and dry tactical movements and things. It gives you, adds in that little extra spice and flavor and sort of magic and special abilities and things. So that's pretty much the turn. You're going to, you know, play a command card and then do all the actions and movements and attacks and then draw. And you have a little bit of a lore step. And there's a few options there. You can gain two lore tokens and just take those. You could get a lore token and a lore card. Or you could draw two lore cards and then discard one of those. Or, my mistake, you don't have to discard one of those. You can discard any out of your hand. Now, you do have a maximum of four uh, lore cards in your hand that you can ever have. So let's just quickly talk a little bit about some possible combat examples, and then I'll come back and tell you what I think. So here we've got some flesh rippers here. These are cavalry, and they're going to attack some of these guards. Now, these guards are supported here uh, by this rock warrior and these archers here, and I'll talk a little bit about support here. But you're going to roll dice equal to the number of attack value on that unit's card, and you've got some different examples here. So if you're in melee here, you can do a hit with this sword sword or the double sword there. Now, if your unit is weak, which means that one of the uh, units has been removed, it's not at full strength, then it'll only get a hit on the, uh, the double sword there. The single sword uh, will not do any damage. Now these two little bullseye looking things, these are used in uh, ranged combat. So if you've got some archers, then you'll want to be rolling these. And this is different than most TNC games, because most TNC games, you're trying to roll basically sort of the flag or the color of the unit you're attacking. Whereas this is kind of based on the attacking unit itself, not on its target. Which is, you know, it's neither here nor there for me. It's just a little different. Now you also can roll these flags here, which are like little morale uh, tokens, and that will cause a unit to retreat one space for each flag. Now there are some different conditions. In this case, it's supported because when you retreat in this, and it's different than in other CNC games, you're actually gonna retreat directly opposite of the attacking unit, not necessarily just to your side of the board, but so if these were over in this hex here, they would actually retreat that way. But since this is supported, see, if it would have to retreat there, then it's not going, it's gonna ignore all the retreats. Now, if for some reason it was blocked, um, let's say on the edge of the board or something, then it would lose units for each flag that it could not actually process. Now the other two things that are, are different uh, for this game, or at least for battle lore, are these little crowns here and these lores here. Now if you roll the lore, then you can immediately just gain lore, but you can also use these for some different effects. Now these uh, crowns here could possibly match the unit here. So if we had some of our blood harvesters attacking, this is really, I really like this card. It's just really bloodthirsty, it really fits. So for example here, so we're going to add one die to each combat roll performed by this unit for each figure missing. So they actually get a little bit crazier and stronger as they start to lose units. So they're actually going to add more dice on top of their three. Now, when you roll the crowns here, you can cause one damage just by doing the crown and you remove one figure from this combat. So they kind of sacrifice themselves here. You know, you take one of these out and then now it's a little stronger and you've basically activated the crown to remove that so the next attack you're gonna be stronger. So there's little different combos and things like that uh, that go with these different uh, units, which is really cool. It's really got that battle lore feel to it. Now, if you fight in melee, then the uh, opponent has a chance to counterattack and they will attack back. Every unit, if we were to sort of wipe this out unit out or make it retreat a square, then this unit can actually take grounds. Just another quick example here, like you've got your Viper Legion here, you roll the crown, it'll put a poison on it, and then you can actually spend, uh, you know, uh, lore to put extra damage on it, and then the opponent then has to spend two lore to get rid of it if they want to activate that unit. So, uh, and there's some other uh, lore cards and things that go along with these different units. And it, like I said before earlier in the review, there are different uh, effects and things that will affect all your units based on the scenario you choose to. So there's a lot of sort of variability in here. Uh, I think that's it. I feel like I'm forgetting something, but there's there's not too many rules. Uh, the game is very quick to play. So let's just go back and uh, see what I think. Okay, I hope you enjoyed the overview. I can't help myself, but this is 
by far the best CNC game that I've played. Okay, so let's back up. I'll explain why. Uh, first of all, the one thing I really liked about Battle or One was the customization of your lore deck and your armies. Um, now they've kind of shifted that a little bit here, and I'm pretty sure I like it better. You know, I feel like it's still early. I feel you know, kind of the newness is, you know, I can still smell it and stuff like that. But I really like how they've shifted a lot of the you know configuration to that the initial setup with the different scenario cards and things like that. Now you, each faction just has their own lore deck, so there's not really uh, configuration there, but the game really kind of configures itself in that way where you're not going to get the same you know handle lore cards, you're not going to go through that many of them in, in, in a one session, so that's going to kind of just take care of itself as far as making that kind of interesting every time. I like that the um, they've got some nice tie-ins with the lore based on the, uh, the scenario cards and you know the different units. Because one thing I really liked about Samurai Battles <laughs> is they had a thing where oh it's been so long where like if you retreated and lost a unit you'd have to do like a lore roll to lose your leader and if you did you'd have to like spend lore or else like you'd have chaos in the ranks uh, which wouldn't quite work here. That was very thematic to the setting of that sort of era in Japan. That was really cool how they did that actually. Um, but there are things in here that you have to consider just based on, you know, do I just spend the lore tokens uh, or, you know, on the cards, but now I've got some other things to consider, just some scenarios where you've got to pay lore to do certain things. Uh, so that's really neat. And so they've got that sort of extra level of just, I hate to call it complexity, but the extra layer of stuff on top of a nice basic CNC thing. Which honestly, when I first played it, um, probably Memoir was the first time I had tried it. And I was, it was just too basic, you know? And I didn't like the, I felt like it was very lucky with the left, center, right thing. Um, now, I mean, there's definitely still luck, but now I've, since I've played it, I've tried other systems and, you know, that have gotten into me more. I really see sort of the, it's the luck, like I said, but you have sort of some real sort of decisions and tactics to decide on as far as like, you know, which terrain to take, and it's way more magnified here. Before, with the other games, it's more like just eliminating all of the units and things, which is fine, but you can, you know, you kind of, it's this sort of cat and mouse chicken thing that happens, where this one sort of actually gets you to attack. Because one thing that you could do, especially in memoir, um, is you can just sort of like, you know, cat around and sort of kite the other guy. And then, you know, you get your unit picked off and then he's kind of low and then, you know, he's an easy target. So that, that happens. This has kind of got that kind of set up where it's a little bit more, I don't know, there's a little bit more dynamics to the terrain. Uh, and it's not just kind of kiting each other. And not everything is, memoir is not like that, but this is, this is, uh, you know, a lot better that way. So, I mean, like I said, the components are great. I love all the different miniatures and models. Um, this is going to come off like a criticism and it's really not there's only two factions which you know that's okay there's there's a quite a variety of units i found i mean i feel like what is this box this is like 90 models in there but, and so um i didn't even show you all the units there that was not all the units i didn't show you cavalry for the, the blue side and there were no i didn't show you the archers or anything like that so there's a good variety here and you know you can mix up and match uh based on the scenarios now you could the rule book suggests that doesn't suggest, but it sort of hints that you could get like two copies. And then you could have two Rock Warriors because there's no limit on uh, the Rock Warriors, the bird. Uh, there's no limit on the number of types of a type you can have. It's just a muster point. So you could really kind of go crazy. Or maybe if you and your buddy had it, then, you know, you could swap out. And then you could try really different configurations with like a bunch of the Golem Warriors or something like that. Or just a ton of archers. Uh, things like that. So there's going to be some nice config. I may... I'm not going to buy a second one, but uh, maybe one day. So I like that there are, um, you know, that configurability. And, you know, there's just a lot of fun stuff. I, I just, it's just really fun to play. I don't know how much to tell you about it. Um, you know, I am already kind of, and I'm not, I'm not looking forward to expansions. I still want to play this. I probably played it five or six times since I got it. And, um, you know, I still want to play. I still want to try, you know, my scenario card against this other scenario card and kind of, you know, the back and forth. I don't know how many combinations of that there are. I haven't played through the campaign and that's kind of a cool thing where you sort of, uh, you know, you go through the A's, the B's and the C's and then the winner gets to choose the higher one or something. I can't remember off the top of my head. So I haven't played it. 
uh, but that's cool I mean that's easily expandable just you know print another deck of like 14 or 15 of the cards or whatever and you've just got you go boom there's an expansion they could do their print on uh, print on demand thing with that uh, so there's a lot here it's very fun there's I like what I'm seeing with where it could go you know like I said I really like that extra resource of the lore and how that's kind of explored because it adds just that extra sort of economic layer of resource management that I really get into but you know it takes it apart takes it to the next level above the rote combat back and forth blah 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 all right this game's awesome uh, if you like CNC I would get this um, you know if you like battle or you like this universe the descent universe then I would get that um, and I think the models are the same scale as descent so I don't know if they'll come out with cards that doesn't really interest me because descent has overlord I don't like games with overlords um, so I would never buy Descent just to get, you know, some, you know, matching bridge mini add-on expansion for that. I just wouldn't do that. But so hopefully they don't go that route because that's just going to, you know, this is kind of like getting me to buy Descent and I won't even play Descent. Uh, maybe I start playing Descent. Stop being such an idiot. <laughs> all right. All right. So, all right, that's it. I would say go get this. It's really, really fun. Definitely not going to be for everybody. If you're like a Euro person that watches my channel, you're like, what is, why does he like this stuff? Um, and then if you're like a strict war gamer guy, this is going to be probably a little bit too, I don't know, silly fun, I guess you'd call it. Uh, but it's really fun. It really, you can just, there's a lot of dynamics that can happen and it's just interesting, you know, fun moments that happen on the, in the battlefield. So I'm done. Uh, take a look. Thanks.